You're listening to the Proposify Biz Chat with Kyle Reck, a podcast for entrepreneurs looking to scale. This episode is brought to you by Proposify, software that streamlines your proposal process, impresses clients, and helps you close more deals. Head to proposify.com to start your free trial today. Hey everyone, I am Kyle Rackey, and this is the Proposify Biz Chat. Thanks for joining us today. And I'm really excited about our guest today. A uh, very special guest, Tucker Max, is on the show. He is the co-founder of Book in a Box, a company that's created a, a new way to turn ideas into books. We're going to talk all about writing books. But you probably know him as four-time New York Times best-selling author, three million copies worldwide, uh, originator of the literary genre fratire, uh, which we can talk more about. Uh, I think he's moved away from that in, in recent years. Um, anyway, just awesome guy all around. Happy to have Tucker Max on the show. Thanks for joining us, Tuck, sir. Tucker. Thank you, Thank you for having me. <laughs> I never get through an intro without screwing up, uh, screwing it up. So, dude, professionals who take you know do this for a living take years to get good at that. It's fine. <laughs> Um, man, I'm excited to have you on the show. Um, just wanted to mention to those listening, I've just started using your service book in a box to write my book. Uh, and I'm super excited about it. I'm actually writing about the process. And, and, uh, so if people are interested in that, they can check that out. But I mean, what a great idea. Can you tell us how you stumbled upon this idea? Yes. So I was doing, uh, I was at an entrepreneur dinner in New York that I got invited to. And this woman uh, came up to me and she's like, you know, I know you published a bunch of books or people tell you, tell me you're the book guy. And I'm like, yeah, that's my only identity is, is book guy. And being, of course, being a jerk. And she's like, okay, well, you know, people have been writing, asking me to write this book for 10 years. And I, I tried to write it myself and I just hated it. I don't have time. She's like, the whole process is just awful. Like, is she, she's like, is there a way for me to get this book out of my head without having to go through like all the nonsense of sitting in front of a computer for a year and dealing with publishers? And I look at her and I'm like, are you asking me if you can write a book without writing it? And she's like, yeah, kind of, I am. And so then of course I go into complete snobby elitist writer mode and I start like lecturing her about hard work and shaming her about wanting to have like the results without the effort and all this sort of stuff. And she, she stops and she's like, Tucker, this is an entrepreneur dinner. Are you an entrepreneur? And I'm like, yeah, of course. And she's like, yeah, I don't think so. Because a real entrepreneur would help me solve my problem and not lecture me about hard work. <laughs> I was like, 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 at first I was like, I was about to light this woman on fire, but then I was like, no, she's right. This is terrible. <laughs> and so I became obsessed with this idea. How do I get this book out of her head? And the, the big thing that she, you know, she said, and, and, and I, of course, was on board with it, she didn't want a ghostwriter. She wanted it to be her words, her voice, her ideas. She just want to hire someone to put her name on a book. It had to be hers. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I, I could not figure out how to do this for months. And then finally it occurred to me, oh, dude, I'm so dumb. People have been doing this for 2,000 years. Because after all, as far as we know, Jesus never wrote a word down. The apostles did. Uh, as far as we know, Socrates so they say. wrote a word down. Well, okay, somebody did. <laughs> but, but for Socrates, at least, we're very confident that Plato sat there and listened to him and wrote his words down. For, for Buddha, his disciples wrote his, uh, his words down. Uh, Malcolm X, Alex Haley wrote it down. Marco mm. Polo, his cellmate wrote it down. They're on the list. And like... All of these great Western minds, or, or Western and Eastern minds, used scribes. Mm. And so, Christ, if Jesus can do it, why can't Melissa, right? And so I, I call her up, and I'm like, all right, like, we'll do this. We'll do a scribe method. I'm going to just interview you. I'll, get all the con I'll do everything but the content. I'll get all the content out of your head, and we'll see how this works. And so it ended up working really well. We did an amazing book. That my buddy Zach helped me on it. We did an amazing book. And then I was, this is how dumb I was, Kyle. I was like, oh, that's a cool project. Like, you know, she made me 10 grand. It probably wasn't worth my time, but whatever. Like, it was fun. <laughs> and then she started recommending people. <laughs> and people started, like, calling me, being like, hey, can you do what? For people from Melissa. I was like, what? What are you talking about? They're like, look, I'll pay 10 grand or whatever you want. I'm like, what? No, I, that, what's wrong with you? How dare you dirty my hands of commerce, right? Like, I was like, and, and so I, like, I ended up basically passing like two or three people to Zach. Then I did Lewis House's podcast and I talked about this just randomly because he's dyslexic and we're talking about like 
this thing I did. And he's like, oh, that's so cool. What do you call it? And I was like, uh, uh, book in a box? Like, because jokingly, Zach and I, that was right after Dick in a Box had come out. And like, that's why I was joking that like, we had the book version of this. Um, and so like, that's actually how we got the name. It's like, wow. I totally panicked on a podcast. And then, and then Lewis is like, oh, it's a great service. Everyone should go, go sign up. And the next day I get an email and I was like, wait, what? Like the, the podcast isn't out. How could, why? Someone's like, hey, I can't find this book in a box thing anywhere on the internet. And I'm like, who the hell are you? And it was Lewis's podcast producer. And I was like, oh dude, that was when, that was for whatever reason, that's when it hit me. And I'm like, Zach, we might have a business here. And Zach's like, oh really? You think dumbass? Like <laughs> we've already sold five of these and we don't offer them. And so we ended up doing like $200,000 worth of business like the first couple months. Holy shit. Like by accident. And that was when it was like, oh, maybe this really is a business. Let's, let's do something here. And now here we are. Man, like <clears throat> I love the naming thing too because it's, it's a perfect name. says exactly what it is. Isn't pretentious or snobby. And it's and you're like, you know, you didn't have a team of people sitting around just like brainstorming this over weeks. It's like, you know, you just throw it out there. Well, you want to hear something funny is um, we're actually going through a rebrand right now. We're re renaming them to Scribe. What? Yeah, we're going to call it Scribe. What, what's the rationale? What's the reason behind renaming? So there's two reasons. One is that Book in a Box, is, this is a great lesson in branding. Book in a Box is good for the reasons you said. I think it actually was a good name for us early on. Because you, you, even if you don't know what, how we do it, you kind of get the idea of what we are. Yeah. But it's a down market name. Like book in a box just sounds a little bit low status and consumer, you know? Yeah. And so uh, scribe, a scribe is like, a, that's a relatively high status profession. At least it was in sort of right. you know, ancient times. And, and a scribe is, is, is someone intellectual. It's someone who assists a great thinker. It's a, it's a, it's a noble profession, like a lawyer or a doctor. Right. And, and, but it also tells you exactly what our role is. Our role is to get your knowledge and wisdom out of your head in, in a way that, that, that best represents it. Our role is not to be the thinker and our role is not writing necessarily in the sense that, that the modern people use the word writing. A scribe's job is, is a conduit for someone else. And yeah, it works. It's a good, I mean, that's a good name too. Let's, yeah. I, I actually, I really like the, there's an image there. Like I think, I think of a bunch of like old white men there in robes, like writing on parchment or. Oh, the, the Greeks, of course, Plato. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that's great. Um, can't wait to see how that, the rebrand uh, unfolds. Did you find that as you, and, and maybe how long did this take? Cause I'm sure when you, did the initial project with a client, you know, you learned a lot of things like what works and what doesn't, how did that process unfold where you started to like really nail down the process? So it's repeatable. Oh man. We're still learning Kyle. That's, that's the God's honest truth is that um, like I met you maybe a year or so ago and I'm actually really glad you didn't sign with us then because we're way better now than we were then. And probably in a year I'll feel the same way. You know, yeah. uh, our process continually, we have a, uh, you know, like all companies, we kind of, not all, but all good companies, we have a, a culture doc. And um, one of our main principles is what we call the class is already broken. And what that means is it comes from this Buddhist story where um, this guy asked a, a Buddhist monk, like, how could you describe Buddhism using just this class? And he, or how could you describe Buddhism just like, you know, in a sentence or so? And the guy said, well, if you understand this class, uh, he held up a glass, then you'll understand Buddhism. And, and the guy's like, what do you mean? He's like, well, uh, this glass is beautiful and it holds my water really well. But I know that whether it's in five minutes or 500 years, the glass will break. So in my mind, it's already broken. And because it's already broken, I can appreciate it for what it is and value the time it has and not hold on to uh, something that is impermanent and, and, and I, you know, that, that's impossible. And, and like that to me describes how we approach our process and how we do things. Like our goal will never, I think, change. People will always have knowledge and wisdom in their heads and they'll always want to put that in books to share with other people. But how we do it, will, uh, the details of that have changed substantially since we started with Melissa. And I think they're much better and they're going to get much better. And so everyone approaches the job like my job is to do the best job getting knowledge and wisdom out of people's heads in the books, not to protect this specific method. Yeah, you know? nothing sacred, right? 
except, think, except the, the mission. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think the best companies know that and they evolve really quickly. And I mean, I want to touch on this. If you, if you're cool to talk about it, you wrote uh, a post saying that you you fired yourself as the CEO of book in a box. So just as one example of how you're not holding anything sacred, if like you just want to complete the mission and however you get, can you talk about that a little bit? Of course. Yeah. So I think this is a great lesson for, for founders. When I was, when we got to about two and a half million, which is about 18 months in, uh, two and a half million in sales total. Uh, uh, Zach and I, like basically the wheels came off. That was when we passed about eight employees, eight full-time uh, tribe members. Uh, and that was kind of when we had to have a middle management level. Sorry, dude, I got a little bit of a cold. I got two, okay. I got two people here. before, which every parent understands like, like what totally. that. And so, uh, uh, once we get, had to add middle management and once we, we had to, or just management, once we had to have a real replicable, repeatable processes, like, man, being an entrepreneur is just a totally different thing than being a manager and, and scaling a company. Scaling is just like, God, it's not, it's not a little different. It is the difference between chicken shit and chicken salad. It's like, just totally, totally different. And the skill sets necessary I'm sure there are some people who are, can be good entrepreneurs and good scaling CEOs, but I'm not one. Mm. And I think very few people are. And so uh, basically I felt the wheels coming off and there were a lot of things going wrong. And it became one of those discussions where Zach and I sat down and it was like, I resisted it at first. We, we actually tried to hire an office person first and it was the total disaster. She, we hired someone from a corporate background. She didn't have startup experience. It was, the worst decision we could have made. And, and so JT was a client of ours and he was helping, he was kind of unofficially coaching me as a CEO. And it was like, man, everything, he would call after every interaction he had with, with our company as a client. And he'd say, okay, you did these two things right. And I'd be like, all right, great, we're doing good. And he was like, hey, you did these 12 things wrong. And everything he would lay out that we got wrong was not a little, like he wasn't, it wasn't an opinion. It was like gut punchingly exactly right. He, we, we were wrong. Wow. And so eventually I realized I had to replace it. Someone had to do the job who was better at it. And long discussions we had with JT, I realized not only was he better, but he was perfect for this job. And dude, my ego really did get in the way a little bit. It was hard for me. Like I, I initially started the discussion of me saying CEO and him coming on as president and COO. Hmm. And then I realized, you know what? That's just. And he suggested that, right? He did. And, yeah. and he did. Uh, but JT's a smart guy. He knew that, that I'm one of those people who really believes in truth and will really look at things the way they are, even if it's unpleasant. Hmm. And as soon as he suggested, actually, I'm like, I kind of like was like, man, that's bullshit. Because the reality is you've got to do all the job, the role of a CEO. So if I stay on, then it's just window dressing. And, and um, I can't, I don't play that, not even with myself. And so that was actually when I decided, I said, I want you to come in. I want you to be CEO. I'll go, you know, be director of product. I'll, uh, that way I can just do the things I'm good at and I like. Mm. And I, I don't have to like uh, do the things I'm not good at. And you know what was crazy, Kyle, is I honestly thought, even then, I thought I was so close to being a good CEO. I just needed a little more time. Mm. Now, after two years of working with JT and seeing him as CEO, I realized I, not only was I not close, I was decades away. <laughs> it wasn't, really? You couldn't even see a good CEO from where I was. <laughs> like, he's a magical man. And it's What's like, the hardest part for you? For me, there's two things. You've got to have insane attention to detail and a grown, especially because we didn't even take like VC money. We are privately funded, bootstrapped, and uh, like the only equity owners are me, JT, and Zach. And so, um, you got to have really insane attention to detail. You got to really focus on, like, you got to know your numbers. And it's like something like I can't do that. I just hate that. But he's a magician, that, number one. Yeah. Number two, you've got to have a lot of experience failing a company. I think you can learn as you go for some people, but like it's way better if you know what you're doing. Like if you, if, you know, if you raise 20 million, it's easier to learn as you go because you got a lot more money to make mistakes, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but to, to scale a private company, you have, really almost have to have done it before or you've got to have someone telling you what to do who really knows uh, what they're doing. And then the third thing, the hardest thing is people. Because mm. you've got to go from a teacher 
and an inspirer, which can work as a missionary CEO, like startup CEO, which is kind of what I was at the beginning. Like I was like, man, I can get up in front of a room and get anyone to pick up, you know, a sword and charge into a wall, that sort of shit. Mm. But like, that's e giving a rah rah speech is actually easy. What's hard is connecting with people and dealing with them and managing them on a day to day basis where they get excited to show up, they do their best work, they grow as people. That all that shit is like really fucking hard, man. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah. And um, I, honest, the honest God answer is I don't really like doing it that much. I would much rather work. I would much rather do the work as opposed to connect with people. At least in a, in a work set, setting, kind of being the boss, right? And but JT loves it and he's good at it. And so like he he loves coaching and developing. And, and connecting with people in that setting. And, and everyone else is like, dude, our team, our team would lay in the road for that guy. Now. Yeah. They love him. And it's, it's works. It's great. You know, I just don't, it's not me. I, uh, I struggle with this as well. I have for the last couple of years and I think I'm getting a little better at it is that idea that when I was so used to being the scrappy startup where I'm designing the screens and I'm writing a little bit of the code actually Jonathan's doing doing it all but maybe a little here and there like I run a run a growth test I just do it and you don't have to ask anybody uh, and then it's like as you get bigger you, there's more processes in place you've got a leadership team they're holding their they're hiring their people and holding them accountable and so that whole game where I like I don't feel like I have direct control over the 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 micro details is it's been a really weird transition and i think that um it's i'm lucky where i've i've got a i know you have a co-founder too my co-founder kevin he and i are almost like co ceos like this he's really good at the emotional stuff and connecting with people everything you're talking about i'm probably better at the vision stuff and like where the product's going so we kind of both act as one <laughs> um it, it reminds me of this like have you ever heard the story about the Coen brothers Yeah, where course. like actors who work with the Coen brothers say they can approach either director and ask a question and get the same answer Yeah, because they I, just I, have the same brain. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how that works. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. But we, we actually are kind of like that. They can ask either one of us a question and get the same answer. Oh dude, that's amazing. Cause you can ask JT and I the same question, maybe on 60 or 70% of things, you'll get the same answer. But on things where I'm great or he's great, you'll, you'll often get very different answers. Like, because yeah. he, where he's great is usually an area of weakness for me and vice versa. Not always. There's some overlap in our skills. But, no, like, dude, I, I probably four times a week I'll say, well, that's why he's a CEO. <laughs> He'll yeah. do something like, yep, I would not have done it that way and that's the better way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you mind if we talk a little bit about the books you've written and, and what you're doing? Um, because... I, I would say people who know you and have read your books, uh, the, the fratire uh, genre, you're really well known for. I know you've been moving away from that in, in recent years. Can you talk about kind of stuff you're working on now or plan to work on and maybe why you've shifted away from that, that subgenre? Yeah. So, I mean, like I was the first guy who ever wrote sort of uh, true stories about all the dumb things guys do in their twenties, right? Partying, drinking, throwing up, you know, whatever, all that nonsense. Um, and so it was just like, the honest answer is, man, I eventually just got tired of doing all that stuff. And I grew up and I grew past it. It was like, I don't, I don't want this to be my life anymore. You know, there's nothing against it. I just don't like, like the thought of drinking like eight vodka sodas and going to pick up girls right now is like, ugh. And I don't mean it as a moral sense, right? If I, like, I liked being 27 and doing that. It was fun. Hmm. But now at 42, it's like, oh, how exhausting is that? Like, Jeez, I, are you I 42? Know, right? Do what? You're 42? Yeah, 42. Jeez, I, th I thought you were like early to mid 30s. Okay. No, no, no. I just act early to mid 30s. <laughs> I'm just immature. Like, but I am <laughs> old. <laughs> right. um, no, man, I just got tired of that. And so it was like, okay, I I'm going to go, um, I'm going to go do what I feel like doing now. And, and now I feel like having a family and I've got this amazing uh, wife and, and my, my kids are kids, but I love them regardless. And, and um, I, you know, it, it just, I, I retired from Fratire before I, I shifted on, but it was like, I felt like, I felt like I couldn't evolve in my life unless I left, unless I left that behind, right? If that became my, I didn't want to become the person that had just had the same identity for 20 years. Like, ugh, how yeah. terrible. You know, and so I had to, 
I made the mistake of building my brand sort of around my, my person, myself. And so like the problem with that is that like, you don't really get, I mean, unless you're David Bowie, which I'm not, you don't get to change. You've got to like play that role. And I didn't want to. So I, that, that's why I retired from it. So that way I could move past it and move on. Mm -hmm. And uh, they made a movie of, uh, I hope they served about you. My life. Yeah. There's been a movie made about my life. Yes. Before, yeah. I turned 30, before I turned 34, there was a movie released about my life. How, how did that process go from turning that book into a screenplay? It was awful. It was the worst. Hollywood's the worst. The really? Worst. I mean, I, I doubt you want me to hijack the rest of the podcast talking about this. I'll just tell you. You can do whatever you want. This is your yeah, podcast now. Yeah, it's your podcast. You don't want to hear about it. I don't want to talk about it. It's okay. It, 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 because it's, I, I would get very inside baseball and it's like very boring unless you're in the Hollywood. I'll tell you the main thing was the main problem. There were two things. One, the Hollywood system, the way it works is just, it's filled with sociopaths. And that's just, I can explain like why the basic reason is just because the economics of the system, which are starting to break up really substantially now with Netflix and, and YouTube and whatever. But at the time in 08, when I shot the movie in 09, when it was released, um, the economics of the system were still very much entrenched in the, the very few gatekeepers, very extractive system, that kind of system, a hierarchical system that just attracts sociopaths. Uh, and, and so that's just the whole system. And I'm not that type of person. That was problem number one. Problem number two is that I was still extraordinarily arrogant and immature and egomaniacal almost. And so when you're, when you're making art in a medium you don't understand, especially a collaborative medium, which movies are, you can't be that way. And I was. And so the movie, it did fine. It didn't do anywhere near what I wanted it to do. But um, it's mainly my own fault, dude. It was like the, the, the creative decision, the decisions I made were ego-driven and not what was best for the movie and not what was best for the audience. Which is funny because in the book, I made the right decisions. But the book is just me. And I understood that medium really well. And I thought, well, I'm a great writer. Why won't I make great movies? Because they're different. And I did not understand that. And I did not have the ability to recognize that. So, it's probably the reason why a lot of authors don't write their screenplay or adapt it, right? Right. But I thought like, well, they either they don't have the confidence or they, they don't have the belief or they, they are smart enough to be humble. I, I actually wrote the screenplay and the screenplay was fantastic. Like the, no problem with the screenplay. The screenplay was like, dude, we had every director in Hollywood, all these Academy Award winners wanted to direct it, all this. Dude, the screenplay was amazing. The, the problem was who I picked as producing partners and directors and who I, um, who I cast, even though they're great actors. I, like, I was a producer on the movie and I just made a lot of decisions that were really poor and I created, honestly, a toxic environment on the, on the movie and said, no one makes good art in toxic environments, usually. Sometimes, the Caddyshack was notoriously toxic. Was it? Yeah, it was. Like, like the stories behind Caddyshack are crazy. And some, but, but that movie had multiple comedic geniuses in it and the director let them spitball on camera mm -hmm. uh which you know when you've got bill murray and all those sort of people then it can work out and the danger field i didn't have those people and my movie wasn't designed that way so it's funny you said that about toxic environments because it's almost uh, I, I i think the opposite of music in a way because some of the best albums of all time were writ were created in these toxic environments the easy examples the white album uh the beatles fighting the whole time, hate going in separate studios, uh, Fleetwood Mac, you know, more recent refused, you know, like there's just so many examples of that, but it's kind of funny how it depends on the medium. Sometimes the, the, the tension serves the art, right? Yeah. No, in this case, it did not. No. <laughs> so um, before we go, cause I don't want to uh, take up too much of your time. Uh, any advice for somebody looking to write a book who's maybe struggling with it because they know it's hard. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So, um, uh, so if you're thinking about writing a book, the first question you have to answer is why and, and not, I don't mean answer, answer that from an artist. I think why am I writing? What am I trying to get out of a book before you answer anything else? Uh, you need to understand that. So like with, with you, with Ellie, you went through, uh, th th that question is the, the ROI question. What are you trying to get out of your book? Like what, what are your goals, right? 
we, we structure it really around business goals because most of our authors, you know, like are using a book sort of as a, uh, as a way to gain authority or visibility is to kind of achieve some business goal. Not the only reason to write a book, lots of other reasons, but you still need to know what it is. Because uh, if you don't know why you're writing a book, then it's really easy to get off track. Once you know why, like what you're trying to accomplish for yourself first, then you need to understand what audience do you need to reach to accomplish that, right? And so like if you want a keynote tech conferences, you need to reach the audience of people who book the keynotes and who attend those tech conferences. If you're writing a memoir to tell your story to your family, your audience is your family, right? So you need to be very, very clear on that. And then the third thing you need to understand is, all right, what do, what do I have to say to reach that audience to get that goal, right? So if you're trying to keynote tech conferences, the audience are people who book keynotes and attend the conferences, you need to say something that is relevant and helpful and beneficial and valuable to those people. If you want to tell your story to your family, you just need to tell your story. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I can go down a million examples, but the point is, those are really the three main questions that if you don't have, if you have clarity on, the rest is really just procedural and informational and you can either do it yourself, you can, we, you can learn to do it, read our book or other books that are really good, or you can work with people who can help you. But if you don't have those three things figured out, chances are you're not going to write the book you want to get what you want, or you won't write a book that will serve you. Yeah. And one thing uh, you wrote and uh, co-wrote with your uh, co-founder, a really good book called The Book, a book in the Book, book in a Box Method. method. Yep. And I read that uh, and it was really helpful. And I think one of the really nice takeaways from that that I think a, a lot of people should probably hear about is if they're writing their book for the wrong reason, like because they want to make a ton of money or they want to become a bestseller, right. you've got some pretty harsh truths in there. Yep. Yeah, there are, it's a, there's a bunch of blog posts about that on the site. And in, you can get the book free. Just go to bookinabox.com slash free book. Oh, cool. Download the book um, that, that you're talking about for free and, and read. Yeah, like one of the early, early chapters really details bad reasons to write a book. And like, it's not that wanting to hit the bestseller list is a bad thing. It's just that if that's your goal, then what you're really looking for is essentially uh, status and ego validation. You're not actually trying to accomplish something. It's not about the book for you. It's just about getting a credential. Like, go, I want to go to Harvard. I want to write a best-selling book. It's like, okay, I mean, like, you can kind of manage that if you want, but, like, the best books are always written because the person has a real sort of – because the best books are always – the message is lined up really well with what where the de demand or need is and no one needs to put someone on the bestseller list but as a as a human i got plenty of problems that i would love to to solve and if someone can write a book that helps me solve them i'm going to buy that book and i'm going to read it i might even hire that person right depending on what it is they they teach um and so if you approach it from the, from the perspective of how can i serve a set of readers then you can write a really good book. And, and now if you write a really good book, now getting a bestseller list is potentially possible, right? And the other big thing, of course, is like you got to have an audience to sell it to because you got to sell thousands, tens of thousands of book, books in a week, which is almost impossible. And people, there's mechanics behind this people don't think about. And that's, so we explain all that in the book. Most people just start thinking about the, the status stuff. They're just, hey, I want to be, I want to have something without actually delivering what's necessary to get it. Mm -hmm. Like, um, without thinking about, oh, hold on, what do I know? Who would value from that? You know, how would a book serve them and also serve me? Because if you could answer that question, you could do an amazing book that could do really well for you, make you a lot of money, raise your status and authority, but it might just be for a small group of people and that might be all you need. Right, yeah, you wanna be the authority on a, a niche, you don't need to sell a million well, copies of that. Most people only have the ability or the, the current ability to be the authority to a niche. So why pretend that the New York Times is going to care about writing your book when you know you all you know how to do is teach something to plumbing contractors, right? right. Like, and there's no shame in that. That's great. Plumbing contractors need to learn stuff. So if you're the expert, go be the expert for them, yeah. and that's cool. And and be cool with what that is instead of trying to pretend that something it's not. Keynote some plumbing conferences, right? No, seriously, yeah. I mean, yeah. like. 
listen, the construction's a big business and, and it's important. I live in a house, you live in a house, right? Someone yeah. built that and the plumbing works. That's important. But so many people are like, oh, they see what Tim Ferriss or Seth Godin, they see what professional entertainers do and they try to Im imitate that without understanding that's a totally different business. Like unless you're in the entertainment business, you can't model how you're going to approach your book the way that they do because you aren't in their field. Yeah. It's, the economics of it, are, everything's different. Totally. Um, people should check out bookinabox.com. Uh, links will be in the show notes uh, to get in on the copy of Book in a Box Method, the book, and also the awesome information on your blog. Um, before we go, Tucker, uh, my girlfriend, who I'm engaged to, she's a massive fan of yours, read all your books. Wouldn't she, that make her your fiance? Not your fiance, girl. my fiance. Uh, <laughs> she, she calls me fiance bae, and it's really embarrassing. She does it in public. It's not good. Um, her name's Christina Morgan. Do you mind giving her a shout out? What do you want me to shout just, out? Just say hi, Christina, you know, whatever. All right. Hey, Christina. I, I like your uh, fiance. He's a good dude. <laughs> that will just, that made, you just made her year. Uh, thanks so much for being on the show, Tucker. Of course, man. My pleasure. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Proposify Biz Chat with Kyle Racky. For more episodes, check us out on YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, or Google Play. Click subscribe to get updated on the latest episodes and be sure to rate and review.